Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. It's an easier time to make art and share art than ever before. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember that you don't have to wait until it's some like actual real job or movie. I'm ready. Ready as I'll ever be. I was just going to say that, Christine. (laughs) (laughs) I think I'm going to kick us off. I'm going to kind of just say like, hello, listeners, welcome to In the Envelope. We are so excited to, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. I am joined by members of the team at Backstage, all of which have been featured on the podcast before. Team podcast, team In the Envelope. Could everyone say hi? Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. <laughs> hey, you all sound great. This is great. Anyway, I just thought it would be nice to have listeners hear what, it's, what a typical team podcast quote-unquote meeting sounds like. We do not have an office backstage. Does not, has not had an office since March. We meet once a week over Zoom, this little podcast team. You know them all, but I'm actually going to like go around the table, quote-unquote, and ask everyone to remind listeners of their name, what they do for the podcast, And then because it's the end of the year and 2020 has been uh, a lot, um, I'm also asking everyone to name their favorite performance, TV or film, SAG, so SAG award eligible performance of the year. And so I'm going to go, I'm going to start off to show you guys, don't be nervous. This is, this is how it's going to go. My name is Jack Smart. I'm the host and producer of In the Envelope. And my favorite performance of the year I have chosen is Rachel McAdams in Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga. I love it. I love it. (laughs) That was unexpected. (laughs) Thank you. That's what I was kind of going for. But it kind of is my favorite performance. Like if I really had to think about a performance that like gave me joy and also kind of gave me chills. I also just, I've always thought Rachel McAdams is like, yes, she's very (laughs) successful, but she's still like an underrated star. I thought that in this movie, she was just the right level of goofy and like earnest. And she took lip syncing because yes, she is lip syncing in that last big song. She took that to the next level for me, which is really saying something because I watch a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race. So that is my pick. Does everybody have met, now have a sense of like what I've put everyone on the spot to do? <laughs> Fantastic. I'll, I'll go next. Um, so I'm Christine mckenna Torella. Um, I am a casting specialist and casting director here at Backstage. Um, and my favorite performance of the year is Anya Taylor-Joy in the queen's gambit Uh, um i find her haunting mm -hmm. not only because of her beautiful alabaster skin uh (laughs) but because she's just she's just fascinating she's just like a little bird or something and it's nuanced and um and there's such a journey that she goes on um and i just think it's she's really exciting to me so that's that's my pick Excellent. it's 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 a close second now with with some of the crying stuff that happened this season because we're getting like one yeah. one and done seasons with you know with our our, our lady die with emma corin and a bunch of people that just did oh, yeah. fascinating work but i always like the unique characters people that have mm. been completely invented right like we're not we're, we, we we have nothing to no expectations and so um mm. Anya Taylor Joy is mine. What an excellent pick, Christine. Who would like to go next? I'll go next, um, mostly because I'm gonna. I want to beat Ben to the punch. Um, <laughs> In case my overlap. name, yes, my name is Casey Howe. Um, I am the awards media um, person here at Backstage, so I help all the clients with their media strategy for awards. So, okay, so um, I have. I'm going to toss out a couple. Um, 
And I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm going to yeah, do yeah. it anyway. So my favorite ensemble of the year is the cast of Ted Lasso. Um, they brought me so, so much joy at a time when I just, we desperately needed it. And mm-hmm. I just am such a fan of that show. So, and I was trying to think of a performance in the, within the show, but then I was like, no, it's the ensemble. It's, it's really the whole crazy. cast together and it's just fantastic. Yeah. So that's Great. one. And then the other one that I really loved the performance of, and it was one of those, um, I always get excited about performances where I'm not a huge automatic fan of that actor or actress, but mm. this performance sort of wins me over. This year was Elle Fanning in The Great. Oh, cool. She really got me with that when I almost sort of, it came out and I think I watched it in March and um, mm-hmm. sort of... I hope that it doesn't get forgotten because I just thought that yeah. that show and her performance was, was really a standout. Um, to toss out a film piece as well, just for fun, so far one that got me was um, Sound of Metal. Riz, uh, Riz Ahmed in yeah. Sound of Metal is okay. a good one. So sorry, that was more than just one job. Sorry, Jack, I'm bad at directions. <laughs> Terrible and the worst. No, that was good. I also <laughs> should have, I should have uh, thought definitely ensembles is, a, is an okay way to cheat at this game because we at Backstage champion ensemble acting and it's so cool that the SAG Awards have that category because of a cast like Ted Lasso, as you say, it is really hard to just pick one performance. They're all amazing. And Casey, I know you beat me to it, but I've actually interviewed all of your favorite actors this year here at Backstage. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so true. You're yeah. right. Totally. <laughs> oh, so so I'll it. jump in here. Um, I'm Benjamin Lindsay, managing editor at Backstage. So Really, that means I have my hands in all the editorial pots, and that uh, goes for the podcast as well. Jack and I work together on uh, basically what this product looks like editorially. Mm -hmm. In terms of my favorite performances, Casey beat me to the punch on Ted Lasso. But for television, I think it would be Laura Linney for season three of Ozark. Awesome. Ozark was one that I was slow to get to. It was, I didn't watch it until quarantine. Um, so I really just plowed through all three seasons in a matter of a couple weeks. And her progression with this character and in the third season in particular, she the power dynamic shifts really from her being the anti-hero rather than Jason Bateman. Like she becomes the Walter White of Ozark. For film, I, I mean, I, I really like my women behaving badly <laughs> based on Laura Linney and this exactly. one. Uh, so Carrie Mulligan and Promising Young Woman. <laughs> She just really blew me away. I rewatched it for the first time a couple days ago. Rewatching. And, uh, yes, rewatching. Mm. And um, yeah, j- just a really stellar performance yeah. and speaks to her versatility as a performer. Um, she's given so much to do here, but then to think that she's the same actress that we met all those years ago playing a 16 year old in education, yeah. um, it's just pretty incredible that she's has all those things up her sleeve so um yeah those are my two favorite women behaving badly that is totally the theme well i guess that leaves me guys (laughs) i'm sam sherlock um i handle most of i guess all of the social media for in the envelope and i also assist casey with awards media well, Ben stole mine because oh. I was <laughs> I was a very big Ozark fan. I didn't binge it over <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> I was watching it before then. Um, You're an OG, an OG. I'm, I'm an OG. I was dedicated from the beginning. Um, but yeah, definitely the last um, season, Laura Linney just yeah. blew it out of the water. And then when we had her on the podcast, I was so excited. She was just incredible in that season and I think it really it kind of just brought everything together I think Ben summed it up really well um I agree with him on all aspects of that a few other shows that I watched that I just really enjoyed I was thinking um Casey had mentioned like ensembles before and Mm -hmm. just thinking of ensembles like the cast of um Schitt's Creek that was a real entertaining thing for me this during this pandemic in a oh yeah crazy year just kind of fun to watch that show and binge it and watch it over and over you guys these are all great picks actually sam i was going to be really shocked if this whole banter didn't go by with somebody mentioning schitt's creek because i (laughs) I was actually shocked no casey didn't say it and then i was pretty surprised ben didn't say it (laughs) any of us that's fair that's fair i think that we were all just so satisfied that they won so many emmy awards we were like okay okay cool so people know right yeah Yeah. this year has 
felt so long that I had to be like, wait, 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 what qualifies and what doesn't? Yeah, totally. Event? Like I, I'm kind of, it's all a blur in a, <laughs> in totally. a whirlwind way. So, um, yeah. so yes, it almost feels like Schitt's Creek was so long ago in my totally. in brain. <laughs> yeah. What a fascinating year for viewing. Like I do feel like the, the quarantine and the pandemic affected our viewing habits and what we want to see and what we like to see. And, but I also think that, Hey, listeners who are uh, SAG, maybe even SAG nominating committee members or eventually anyone in SAG who's voting in the SAG awards. We've just, we've just given some solid campaign tidbits for our favorite actors. So for your consideration, listeners. Certainly. And lots of TV this year for sure. And I think that, so you know, film is going to be something where it's, you know, I feel like television was a bit of a, like a, like a dump this year and not in a bad, but like, there it's was so much, happen. like so much, you know? Yeah. And um, I think that, you know, over the next two months or so, it's going to be that dump of film where normally yeah. it would be more spread out, but now mm. it's just going to be like, boom, 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 boom. That's such a good point. There, there's, um, it's just true that even though this year has been so challenging and so challenging for the industry, it is a very good year for film and for TV, of course. And it's exciting, yeah. you know, it, taking the, the, the lemons and making lemonade, the accessibility yes. level of the streaming of these major movies immediately, you know, I love that. Do I, do I want to sit in a dark room with strangers with popcorn sometime soon? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. One million percent. I love going to the, the movies, but I also think it's really exciting to be able to see it immediately and feel like it's a little exclusive, you know, like, so I'm looking forward to all of these movies coming out and we're going to be able to see them immediately. That's so true. Here's to a better 2021, a great 2021, uh, that I have no doubt will be better than 2020. <laughs> oh, we should have brought glasses to clean. Cheers to that. that. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> One million percent, Jack. <laughs> oh, the toast of 2021. Here we go. Clean. <laughs> I love that. Oh my God, how perfect. Happy New Year, everyone. And um, thank you for joining me for this, the most fun banter we've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> Listeners, let's take a quick break. This sounds so weird to say this in this Zoom meeting. Listeners, let's take a quick break and then get to this interview with Julia Hart. Wow, that was really stagey, but something like that. We'll just, <laughs> Jamie will fix the transition or something. <laughs> hey, if you are an actor or an aspiring actor, someone at the beginning of your artistic career, and you haven't signed up for Backstage yet and you don't know how it works, I have good news for you. Backstage is offering 30 whole days completely free just for our In the Envelope listeners. If you visit backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, you will have full access to the site where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start applying to the thousands of casting notices uploaded every single day on the world's number one casting platform. Again, we are giving listeners of this podcast 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. Go to checkout, that's backstage.com slash subscribe, and enter the code ENVELOPE. If you want to be in contention for an Emmy or for an Oscar or for a Tony or for a SAG award, do as many of the guests on this podcast have suggested and use Backstage. We are here for you. Again, free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe. Enter the code ENVELOPE. Before becoming one of Hollywood's most exciting writer-directors, Julia Hart spent formative years teaching, a job that would inform her work on set with actors. Along with her husband and writing and producing partner Jordan Horowitz, Julia has been the auteur behind Miss Stevens, Fast Color, this year's Star Girl, and from Amazon Studios, I'm Your Woman, a 1970s crime drama starring Rachel Brosnahan. Here's our interview with the brilliant Julia Hart. Julia, hi, welcome. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in there. Um, this is Backstage's podcast. Uh, of course, because we are backstage, we are all focused on the craft and career advice, and I'm going to ask you your whole life story. Um, <laughs> do you? Did you ever use Backstage, or do you have a relationship with us? I do. I So I grew up in New York. Okay. And I feel like it was the Bible for so many millions of artists in Yay. New York. And I 
did a little bit of theater in New York before I moved to California. Mm. I did a couple of, I had an off-Broadway play, one act play that I wrote that was produced by MCC Theater. Oh, wow. And then I yeah. did, I choreographed an off-off-Broadway show like right before I moved to California. And so, yeah, it was like always... You know, there were always like so many copies of backstage. I also used to be a dancer and I took classes at Steps okay. and there were backstages oh. all over Steps on Broadway and, yeah. you know, and BDC. And it, 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 it's definitely something that has been in my life for a long time. Well, that's great. Um, where did you go to school and um, what is the trajectory? Because you when did you go to school and then when did you move from New York to L.A.? So mine's kind of a funky story because I was always... I was raised by artists. I was always an artist. I was always dancing and doing theater and seeing theater and writing plays and directing plays. I went to Columbia, so I was like very much a New Yorker for mm -hmm. a long time. Um, but I did that thing that some artists do where I, I guess I didn't believe in myself enough or I was too scared to take the risk mm -hmm. of like actually, you know, taking the, taking the leap when I graduated and just, you know, trying to make it, trying to make a, a living as an artist. And mm. so I became a teacher, which was mm -hmm. also a passion of mine. I right. was a literature major. I wasn't like a theater or film major in college. I was a literature major and I did a bunch of student theater because I was interested in the directing and writing side of things. And there were so many opportunities at Columbia, uh, for students to, to do to, to direct and write in the um, the world of student theater there. Um, mm. And so I got a job as a teacher and right. I was a teacher for eight years. And okay. three years into that, <laughs> I had to do the math, three years into that, I met Jordan Horowitz, my uh -huh. husband and now writing partner and producer of all of my films. And... Mm he got me to get back into that part of myself that had always wanted to be a writer and had oh, wanted to cool. be a director. And he ended up being the, this is not grammatically correct, but I can't figure out how else to say it, but he ended up being the believing in me part of me that I had oh, sure. kind of put in a box and he opened yeah, it oh, up yeah. and he encouraged me and got me writing again. And, uh, I was teaching, we, we moved out here cause he was producing. We moved out here and I was, I taught out here for five years, um, before mm. I actually quit teaching and, and became a screenwriter full time, but he got me writing right. again. And I wrote a couple of scripts and he shared them with colleagues of his. And I ended up signing uh. with an agent and my first script, The Keeping Room, ended up on the blacklist. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I ended up quitting at the end of that school year. And finally at, gosh, how old was I? I think I was like 30. I mm. finally found that part of myself again and took that, that leap. And that is really now I'm a cool. full-time artist. <laughs> which is, which I, I guess has always been the dream. Like you said, it was the, it was the more like, it's a part of you. And sometimes there are phases in your life when it's not the biggest part of you, right? Yeah. And I also needed to be a teacher for eight years. Okay. I look back at it now and I think another part of me was mm -hmm. doing what was best for me. Like I needed sure. to go be of service. I needed to go grow up a little bit. I needed ah. to... I had a lot of things to learn myself. And that's the funniest thing about teaching is that you end up learning. Hmm. Hopefully, than, hopefully not more than you teach, but certainly <laughs> closer. It's a closer ratio than I think a lot of people realize, but it was a very important, I had, you know, I had an incredible time teaching. I am still very close to a lot of my colleagues and my former students. It was hmm. a very important and formative part of my life that I use a lot, especially as a director. There's a te leading a classroom sure. and running oh, a yeah. set have a lot in common. Oh, see, that's so interesting. Yeah, because of course, so while you're teaching, you are writing the screenplays. You're 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 dabbling with the thought of maybe one day becoming the making the transition to being an artist full time. But of course, the teaching, they, those have to be, like you say, those have to be relevant skills to directing and to writing. Is it true also Miss Stevens was inspired directly by experiences that you had teaching? Yes, not 
and nothing that <laughs> happens in the movie Not ever actually happened. I have, yeah, I have, I had very healthy relationship with my kids and with myself. I have dealt yeah. with my my grief and my trauma in a healthy way, unlike Miss mm. Stevens. Mm. Um, but it was really fascinating being, it, the, the part that it's most based on is that it was really fascinating. I was teaching 17 and 18 year olds when I was 25. And they were looking to me like I, you know, I was the adult who was supposed to have the answers and I was still mm. figuring so many things out, clearly even just career wise. Um, mm. And so it was really fascinating to me that very important but very fine line between what it means to be a child and what it means to be an adult and how adults are still learning and kids are often wiser than we think they are. Mm. Um, and there are definitely, and it's been really cute because a lot of my former students are like, is Margo based on, you know, like they, yeah. they definitely see themselves or their classmates in the characters, <laughs> which is fun too. And that's just so cool. The, um, this idea that you can use your life without using it autobiographically, because as you say, the growing up, that is what fuels, right? The artistic process. Yeah, it is interesting. I feel like there are movies that are explicitly autobiographical that filmmakers have made, mm -hmm. but you can also just use a world, you know, write what you know can also just be a world you spent time in, even if it's not your story within that world. Oh, so cool. And it's also safe to say, write what you know is not a guiding principle of your... Can I ask, like, what is what would you say is your artistic mission, artistic statement? <sighs> <laughs> It's such a good question. Um, I I became a filmmaker because I love movies and I'm incredibly passionate about storytelling, which is so much of what teaching is about and writing is about, is telling telling human stories. But definitely part of that statement is also that as much as I love films, there are a lot of genres that don't represent me and the stories yeah. or the characters within those genres that I'm interested in telling. And so it's definitely about authenticity and the, the human story, but also the human stories that haven't been told. Oh, and that's what I love. Okay, so this is one of the things I love talking to people about is this idea of, and this is, this is related to what you were just talking about with Write What You Know, is like, is, so part of your mission is to tell stories that are underrepresented and that are not as typical, which does that first require kind of knowing what are the stories that are told and knowing the ground rules and then like trying to break them? Yeah, I think one of the most important things about breaking genre is knowing that genre intimately, you know, okay. with fast color. Like I'm a yeah. huge fan of all the Marvel movies. I've seen yeah. them all. Like I love big superhero movies. That's and so, so cool. I think you have to you know, it's funny because I've definitely also run into genre fans who don't like it when you break the genre or will <laughs> say like that you don't, you broke it because there was something wrong with it. Or you didn't love it. These are usually right. straight white men who say these men. things. Men, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, I actually think you have to love a genre in order to even be interested in breaking it. And the breaking of it is actually not because there's anything wrong with the genre. Mm. There's just been a section of the population, a very big, very important section of the population that has been left out of it for so yeah. many decades. And so, you know, the breaking of the genre only comes because you don't want to drop a black woman into a white male structured version of that genre. You want to break the genre. Mm -hmm. you, you don't just cast a black woman. You want to break the genre in order to represent mm -hmm. black women. Mm -hmm. And so the breaking of the genre is just about the shifting of the perspective and the protagonist. It's not because, you know, the genre itself is broken in any way. Right. And it does come from your love. And is it also safe to say it comes from you seeking to challenge, to provide opportunities for people, but to also challenge audience perceptions? Because I do feel like, and maybe you've heard this from a fan who said, well, I don't normally like when genre is played with or when it's broken, but in your case, I, my horizons were expanded or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And it's fun because, you know, the the dirty secret of all elements of art these days, television, film, mm. novels, whatever your medium is, is that every story has been told. It just okay. hasn't been told about every person. 
And so there are so many opportunities to tell tried and true stories, familiar stories, you know, the hero's journey, the villain's redemption. Mm. Like there are so many great stories. There are just so many people that those stories haven't been told about. And so what I find exciting and interesting as a filmmaker is finding new ways to tell stories about old stories about different people. And so the familiarity of those stories and the love, I love that you say the love of those stories, that's a big part of it. But then is there, is there also a point in your process where you, where you, but also I guess any artist, anyone listening to this podcast needs to feel empowered enough to say, well, I can give my take. I have something to offer to this genre, theme, story arc, character, trope, whatever, right? Absolutely. And I think until, you know, more people see themselves represented in the stories that the powers that be deem important enough to pay for and market and distribute, uh, you know, they, they won't, they won't necessarily know that that's even possible. I mean, I look at, I look at Kamala Harris and it's just like, yeah, my God, I'm going to cry just like (laughs) every time I talk about her, because we guys start crying, like just the millions and millions of girls and brown and black girls who now see that they can be the freaking vice president of the United States. I mean, wow. And I also think about, I have two little boys and I think about how important it is for them to see that too. So talk to me about how inspiration works for you. How would you say you consume art and then filter that into your art? Mm. Well, especially as someone who's interested in breaking genre, it's a big, a big part Mm. of it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, It's weird, like sometimes an idea will just come out of nowhere. And then sometimes an idea will come out of another piece of art, a song or a movie. Um, We were, when we came up with the idea for I'm Your Woman, we were on like a particular um, 70s crime genre binge week. (laughs) And, uh, And that's always really fun when you are just watching movies because you love them and then you have an idea for a movie to make yourself. And then you get to go make it. I mean, what's better than that? Well, totally. And that's, I'd actually love to hear the step-by-step for, let's take I'm Your Woman because if that's then the initial inspiration, well, like what's the next step? (laughs) And and was it... um, was the angle like I would like to substantiate the female characters in these types of movies? Well, we were watching we were watching Thief, Michael Mann's first feature, which is uh-huh. one of my most favorite movies. And there's a moment where Tuesday Weld, who plays Jesse, goes one way and the movie goes another. And I love mm. where the movie goes and it's awesome and James Conn is amazing and Robert Prosky is amazing and it's the Tangerine Dreams score is amazing like it's it's so good but I couldn't after I finished the movie I couldn't stop thinking about like well what happened to Jesse and David like where are mm. they going what's going to happen to them like what's their story is she going to be okay like who's going to help her and and um and then I turned that you know that wondering into a character okay. uh and perhaps there was a story and an, her own movie for where that character goes. Um, awesome. And so, you know, what first happens is like, I have to do a little bit of ruminating myself and like note taking myself before I open my mouth to Jordan, because I know mm. he's going to pounce with a million questions and I want to oh. be ready for at least half of them. Uh, and so then usually, usually the time that I, we'll share an initial idea with him. Is like, after we've put the kids to bed, we always try to like sit and have a moment in the day that's just the two of us. Okay. We try not to talk about work, but inevitably we always do. And I remember mm. we were like sitting on our porch um, drinking and <laughs> which is an important part of the creative process. Sure. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I I started to tell him the idea and, and then it, it goes from there. And there are definitely like some voice notes memos that I, I think one of us still has, of, oh. you know, recording, like when we start to um, throw an idea back and forth and, 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 you know, like move it around in our heads, we'll mm. usually, you know, turn on the recorder and start throwing ideas back and That's forth. And then eventually when we're like, oh, this, this could be something, one of us will kind of transcribe the mo- the best parts of the voice memo. And then that is kind of the initial the or the the beginnings of an outline 
That's so that's so fascinating because the, it sounds like the voice memos facilitate. You can't just sit there writing out your ideas. It's first about speaking them and hearing them, and sort of then editing them down. Yeah, yeah. And, and then like going back works. and forth and back and forth. Yeah. And do you guys have this down to a science? You have said <laughs> that you're more dialogue focused and he is more structure focused. Yeah. And it's funny, like, you know, we've written, God, I wish I actually knew the number. <sighs> How many scripts have we written together at this point? More screenplays you know, than have been produced. Exactly. Because right. like we've been writers for higher on, higher on things uh. that haven't ultimately panned out or are, you know, stuck in the studio system. Mm. Um, we've also written scripts that we sit on and kind of wait until we're ready to, to make them ourselves. Um, but we've got to have written at least like 12 scripts together at this point. What's been cool that was really unexpected Mm. was that we've both gotten better at what the other person, it hasn't stayed like I'm mostly dialogue focused and he's mostly structure focused or action line focused. Um, we've really both started to get better at what the other person was better at. And that's been really fun because he used to be really, because he never identified as an artist or a writer. You know, he was really focused on producing, but he's actually Mm -hmm. a really, he's a really beautiful writer and he's gotten better over time and we've made each other better and push each other and challenge each other. But like few things make me happier than when like he'll be brave enough to write a dialogue scene from scratch by himself before uh-huh. I've given input. And then it's great. Like he'll write a couple of great lines and it just makes me so happy. So yeah, it's that funny. Really like it's, cool. it definitely started out that way, but it's more right. as we've just gotten That's better. That's so cool. At, you know, and what it, we do. It, it should evolve, right? Like any, any writing collaboration or any solo writer, their craft has to, it can't possibly be the same every time. I asked if it was science, if it's down to a science, I guess that's impossible, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely like, it's, we definitely don't have to think about it anymore. It just kind ah. of happens. You know, mm. we um, we just wrote, and I can't talk about it yet, but what will probably be our next film. Cool. Um, but Quarantine project. Was, cool. Yeah. Oh, my God. The best. We're so lucky to be writers. Um, it's the sure. easiest thing to do in quarantine. Sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was so cool because... It it, it 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 was a script that we wrote where we actually realized that it was down to a science in a lot of ways without us even uh, having realized it. Like it just, mm. we did the thing where we talk about it and then we write it down and then we wrote the script and it was just this like, it took a while to get to the initial idea because we'd mm. been hired to do something, but we had to figure out what it was going to be. Um, we had been hired with like an idea in mind and we had to figure out the story and the structure and the world and everything. Mm. Um, but it was so cool. Like, it's sort of like, you know how when you're driving, mm. sometimes you like, and not in a dangerous way, but you're just, you're, you're on autopilot in a lot of ways. You're not like tuned out, like you're focused, but you don't have yeah. to think about it anymore. Sure. Like you Instinct- just, you, yeah, you, yeah, it becomes, it becomes instinctual. And so that was, that mm. was really cool. And that was the first time that had happened. Because I guess it is kind of like a muscle. And once you've done the work of, yeah, like the initial stages of the inspiration and then the revisions, if that becomes more second nature, it's just more efficient. Like I think our brains are just trying to make the process more efficient. So we learn how to tap into instinct. It is also a job. Like it's so funny. Like Uh I've never... I've never treated it. And again, this is where I think having been a teacher for eight years really came in handy. Like it's a job. I don't think of Mm -hmm. like, I don't think of myself as like, I call myself an artist because that is the profession, but I certainly don't like allow myself any artistic tendencies, (laughs) you know, like Mm. tantrums or writer's block or (laughs) I don't know, asking for too much. Like I wake up in the morning, I go to work, I do my job. I have a certain number of pages that need to get done. I have a deadline. You just do it, you know? And I think that especially as working parents and especially right now when everything is so much harder than it, um, than it was before, um, COVID and quarantine and everything. Like it's, it's such an, it's so important. Like I know writers talk a lot about routines and I just, Mm. and structure. And I just think it's so important. That's a great point that, I mean, writers should treat it even if they are not as you say, a professional full-time artist, um, putting yourself in the mindset of I am a professional writer and I have deadlines to meet and pages to churn out 
and therefore got to set up a routine, that is going to help early career artists more than like, I would like to be a writer. Like you got to mimic the life of a professional writer to be a professional writer. That is such, that is such a good way of putting it. And it's such good advice when you put, when you put it that way, Mm. that it it needs even like, even when I was teaching and I wasn't Mm. able to in, in a literal way, mimic the life of a working professional artist, I would still, you know, I would, I would teach all day. I would do whatever lesson planning and grading I needed to do. And then I would write, and this was before I had kids. So it was a lot easier. Mm. Um, but I would, I would write for a solid block every night. And then I would write both days of the weekend. I would write, and I would write in a solid block in a, in a, in a way that mimicked what it would be like mm. if I was actually doing it for a living. And it is, it's so important if you actually are serious about it and want to break into it, you have to find the time to be serious about it. Mm. Yeah. Gosh, that's great. Um, the other, the next step, I guess, of the process, and you've spoken about this in interviews before. And of course, as backstage, we love hearing about like actors and casting. Um, at what point in the process does that, or like, where would you say in your, um, let's take I'm your woman, for example, what do the actors lend to that process? What inspiration do you get from them? Does the script ever change depending on casting? Um, I'm so glad that that's one of your favorite things to talk about because it's one of my favorite things to talk about too. <laughs> Yay. Actors, I I love I love actors. Actors yeah. are, you know, they're the best. They're the most brave, crazy, beautiful <laughs> people I know. So many of my closest friends are actors. I just, it's the mm-hmm. best. I mean, I love all of my collaborators, but casting. And working with actors is my favorite part of making movies. Oh, cool. Casting is so important. Um, mm-hmm. And the scripts absolutely change. The craziest thing Jordan and I have probably ever done as filmmakers was we were in the midst of writing the first draft of Fast Color when uh-huh. we saw Gina Prince by the Woods be on the lights for the first time. Yes. And I had never seen Goo Goo before. Mm-hmm. And if you know the film, you know that it's a crazy introduction to an actor. It's sort of like um, mm. Naomi Watts in Mulholland Drive. Like if you'd never yeah. seen her act before, you're like, oh my God, like what is this performance? Like who mm-hmm. is this actor who made me think they were this one thing and then yeah. showed me that they were this totally other thing that I mm. had no idea was coming. Um, and that's what Gugu's performance is in that movie. And so Jordan and I made the crazy decision to write the part for her. Hmm. We went back to page one and we wrote it with her in mind. And it's funny because there are some writers who are like, don't write with actors in mind. And I actually think like, well, if you want the thing to be made, you should probably write with actors in mind. That's hmm. my philosophy anyway, because even if it doesn't end up being that actor, you'll end Mm. up having a script that feels so specific and so alive because it was written with a real specific person in mind. Okay. And so I feel like that makes all the difference. And I feel like even if Gugu hadn't said yes, um, we would have had luck finding the right actor with Mm -hmm. the specificity that writing with her in mind brought to the script. But luckily she said Mm. yes. (laughs) Mm -hmm. She was the first person we sent the script to and she, like she read it, in like an unprecedented like 12 hours after having uh, it sent to her and i met her a few days later and you know we made so cool. the movie and she's the best human she is she's been on this podcast we, we spoke to her a few, oh, a she few has? months ago yeah she's... uh not long after lockdown yeah it was awesome oh amazing yeah she's one of the best human beings yeah i she, and and a good friend and I I love her so much and I'm it's still so funny to me like she didn't even I realized that I hadn't told her that story and we were at a and a for Fast Color and I was oh. telling that story and she was like what <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny because I had told it in the press and so I had forgotten that mm. I hadn't told her it was really funny um she's very flattered of course it's a nice thing for an actor I think to find out that right a writer has written something for them or with them in mind or or whatever and um, That's, you know, yeah. I, I wrote, I'm your woman before I, I knew who Rachel was as an actress. So mm. it, it, you know, Jean, Jean came out of the Tuesday Wells and the Diane Keatons and the mm. Allie McGraws of the seventies films. And, and also out of my own experience, there's a lot of, there's a lot of me in Jean and, um, oh, cool. you know, then 
when we first came up with the idea was when House of, the first season of House of Cards came out. And then when we were sort of getting ready to share the script with um, people and, and try to get it made, the first season of Mrs. Maisel came out. Okay. And my <laughs> favorite thing to do is cast someone in something they've never done before. Yes. And, peop- and, you know, people often like to cast actors in the same type of roles. And I Mm -hmm. actually find it much more fun to just trust that they're a really brilliant actor and Mm -hmm. can do anything because most actors can, that's the whole point. Um, and, uh, and so we had seen her, you know, play Rachel in house of cards and Midge and Mrs. Mm -hmm. Maisel. And we (laughs) were like, here's a completely other different thing that we think you would be extraordinary at. And I, I think she is, and is totally Mm -hmm. disappears into the part. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah. And, and then, you know, we, she and I had several, once she signed on, she and I had several, um, long conversations that I think are part of the rehearsal process. And most actors do too. Like rehearsal doesn't mean, you know, just getting up on your feet, you know, rehearsal, um, is oftentimes just, you know, just long conversations about the script and the character and their history and all of that. Um, and then I rewrote Mm -hmm. the script, um, and uh, something else that I do a lot when I'm casting that I think might be an interesting tidbit to share. I don't, I've actually never asked any other directors if they do this. <laughs> I prefer to watch interviews with actors. Oh, cool. Um, video oh. interviews as opposed to like other films of theirs. Yeah. It's obviously Were useful there... to see them in other films, but mm-hmm. I also just like to see them as people, how oh, they move, wow. how they talk, how they react to things. Um, it's why I think either, you know, this was, <laughs> I haven't cast a film since Zoom has been like the norm, but, yeah. you know, either over Zoom or Skype or FaceTime, if you don't get the opportunity to meet them in person, um, mm-hmm. especially again, the way things are right now, it's just so important to just see them and watch them and observe and them And you mean like people. to see the physicality of themselves, but also to get to know them as, as a person? Like, is this also yeah. for the function of like the person that you would like to just spend time on set with and be a collaborator with? Yeah, I just think that it's so important to obviously you want to work with talented people, but we definitely I don't know if I can curse on this podcast. Please do. But we definitely have a no asshole policy. And okay. unfortunately, several <laughs> slip in occasionally because they somehow trick you into thinking they weren't. And then you just have the privilege of not hiring them again. Uh (laughs) Um, but in general, like I haven't had that happen with an actor. I have been so blessed. I, I am completely in love with all of the actors that I've worked with. They've always been, I've never had any like issues or problems Mm. or people being disrespectful. Mm. Um, you know, and that's something that you get to set you get to set the tone as the director mm-hmm. and I am very, I am very intense about that, about how important it is. And again, that comes back to teaching, like yes. just how important it is to respect everybody and create a mm-hmm. safe environment for everybody because making movies is emotionally vulnerable, but it can also mm-hmm. be physically dangerous. And so it's oh. important to create physically safe, you know, when you're doing like stunts and oh, sure. you've got 300 background actors on a set that have to run <laughs> onto the street from inside um, of a building, you know, disco. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, it is, I, I hold every single one of those lives on my mm-hmm. back every day on set. It is my responsibility to make sure everyone's safe. And so I need to hire people who also feel that way. And so it mm. starts there, you know, but uh, actors are like, I, I don't know. I like, I just feel like if you're going to be an asshole as an actor, like maybe you should go do something else. I don't know. It's such a, oh, I mean, it's that's such a, too. yeah, it's such a privilege and such an honor to mm. get to be a working artist. Like, mm. and I think too, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I have mostly worked with people who started in theater. Uh huh. I have worked with a lot of stage yeah. actors and they just, they bring a certain work ethic and responsibility. I've never had an actor not know their lines, which I know Mm -hmm. is a problem in a lot of film, on a lot of film sets, actors forgetting their lines or not knowing their lines. You know, from 10-year-old Sanaya Sidney to, I won't say how old, but you know, the older (laughs) actors I've worked with, like everybody has always come to set knowing their lines. And I think part of that is the fact that they have theater backgrounds. And part of Mm -hmm. that is that, you know, I really believe in the rehearsal process and just the 
the dignity of the written word and how important it is to mm. come to come to work ready to work you know it sounds like yeah respect for actors is so important for for specifically a director to have and you know i've never heard this thing about if about the focus on on making a set physically safe and how tied that is to like it's just true that if you have assured your cast and your crew that it's a physically safe set that that then allows emotional vulnerability because they feel that they can really that they're in good hands right and that is all the director's job yeah and i and if something there are have we all know there have been accidents on set and the mm. worst thing in the world has happened on more sets than should have but it yeah. happens and it is on you as the director and every, mm. you know, it's, I always say on the first day of all of my movies, like I, I, I give a speech and I talk about how we all need to respect each other. And as much as we all take our job seriously, at the end of the day, we're making a movie. Like it's a piece of entertainment mm. and it is our, our jobs and our livelihoods and how we support our families. But at the end of the day, like no, like no shot, mm. no set piece, no scene is more important than every single person's life on set. Beautiful. And it's just, yeah. you know, you hear, you, you hear these stories about actors getting hurt and like directors knowing, honestly, it's part of why I became a director was I was just like, we can do better. Like I was on some sets where cool I saw some, some shit go down that was so not okay. And it's like, what, like, what's the point? It's just a movie. No disrespect right. to movies. We all love them. And it's our job. It's still our job. But like, it's, it's because of respect to movies hurt. that you want to. Yeah. 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 See, okay. That's so cool to hear, especially just. Can I ask you about just the simple fact that you are a female director in a male, a very male dominated job? <laughs> Historically, uh, the, I mean, the statistics are, it, it never gets old. Like every time I look yeah, at the statistics of female directors, I'm still like, what? <laughs> like I'm not, yeah. yeah, it's still so shocking to me. So like, what would you say? I'm sure you're asked for advice for directing all the time. What would you say to specifically women who want to get involved in this very male dominated field? Just to not wait for permission. I did. Mm -hmm. And mm. I'm fine. Like I'm like, I've made a career as a director, but like, mm -hmm. I wish that I, um, you know, I wish that I had been, as I said, you know, braver about putting myself out there. Uh, when I was younger. And I, I think too, it's such an exciting time to be a woman mm. or a person of color or any minority group that is underrepresented um, by the people who end up getting to direct most of the movies in our world. Mm -hmm. um, it's such an exciting time because they can, they can make a movie on their phone mm -hmm. and they can post it on the internet. You know, they can cool. share their art. It's easy. It's an easier time to make art and share art than ever mm -hmm. before. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember that you don't have to wait until it's some like actual real job or movie. Um, there are opportunities for writers and filmmakers to, mm -hmm. to share their work in ways that, you know, weren't, weren't around even like when I was in my twenties. And so I think it's important to just go do it. Mm. That's great advice. That's exactly, I mean, that's exactly what we love to hear. If there's, if there were one piece of advice that you would go back, maybe not necessarily that you would go back and tell yourself for your career, but like, what do you wish early career artists knew more? I think that there is, I think one of the mistakes that gets made is thinking that as a young artist or an underrepresented artist, when you do finally get mm. the opportunity to have to pretend that you know everything because mm. you have to represent either your gender or your race oh, or, wow. um, you know, you are worried that because you are a woman or a person of color that these other people aren't going to listen to you or take you seriously. And so I think a lot of young artists make the mistake of acting like they know everything and, and push putting, making themselves be inauthentic, which is mm. obviously the opposite of being an artist. Wow. And so I after having not been brave for a very long time, when I walked onto the set of Miss Stevens, it was my first time. I hadn't made a short. It was my first time mm. directing anything. And yeah. I was just very honest. Mm -hmm. I was like, you guys have all made more movies than me and I'm in charge. <laughs> and that's cool. funny. 
And I don't want to hide or be afraid of the fact that you guys know more about me than certain things. So I am going to say, I don't know. Wonderful. And I had to, I had to do that a lot and it was really liberating. And mm-hmm. what happened was it wasn't that my crew didn't respect me. They actually felt respected by me mm-hmm. because I was listening to them mm-hmm. and learning from them. Instead of like walking around pretending I knew everything, I was getting to learn so much and they were getting to teach and that made them feel respected and important. Mm. And so I gained their respect by being honest instead of being all knowing. <laughs> and um, right. putting on and it act. was great. Yeah. And I think that you yeah. also, the only way you can be that vulnerable, that vulnerable and that honest is that when you are given the information, you know what you want. Like I had to learn about lenses and it's Mm -hmm. like, okay, I don't know what these different lenses do, but then the moment you are told what they all do, you have to know what your vision is with Mm -hmm. that information. Mm -hmm. So you can't then be like, oh, well, what do you think? You know? So I think it's important to, to be, to be clear and knowledgeable about what you want, but honest about what you don't know. Mm. That's so cool. I love that. That's because that's, that also beautifully illustrates the idea of delegating and how is it this uh, cinematographer's job to present colors to you and you may not, especially on your first movie, know exactly how, everything that goes into that, but when options are presented to you or a decision has to be made, that is not when you say, I don't know. Yeah, That's exactly. when it's up to exactly. you. Yeah. 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 Your use of color and music in your movies is... I think that's almost, I feel like there's a couple through lines in your films, but color and music to me are like, I don't know, good examples of you said yes to the right things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Cause those are two of my most favorite things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's like the best thing about finding your crew family is that you find mm. people who love and prioritize what you love and prioritize. Ah, cool. And we just geek out about color. Yeah, <laughs> my, cool. my DP and my costume designer and uh, my production mm-hmm. designer and I, we've made three movies together now and we just geek out about color and it's so fun that's um, cool too because talk about efficiency like uh down quote unquote down to a science is that you have your crew you know your dynamics your your set and then music is i i've i've been in love with the ability to put the right song to the right image i mm. used to like I, when i was in college and like i movie first came out i was constantly like taking movies of me and my friends and setting them to music and making like these little music videos like that's just always and when I was directing plays in college too I was always putting soundtracks to them and it's always just been one of my favorite things to do and then I found my music my film music soulmate in Dan Wilcox who's my music Mm. supervisor and he did um he did Miss Stevens and Fast Color and then Disney has their own music department um and then he also did I'm Your Woman and again it's like it's so Mm. fun when you find someone who understands what it is that you want to do with music and image and goes, you know, right along that, totally. uh, that journey with you. Music supervision is a very cool, like profession. It's a very cool career that I feel like is recently becoming recognized as more than just score. I mean, score is also its own thing, right? Oh score yeah. Is score separate, is like a I whole guess. other conversation, which I, yeah, which yeah. I also love. I also love that part of my job. But yeah, so music supervisors are responsible for either finding or securing songs that you've already chosen as a filmmaker, and then Mm. also negotiating with the record companies and the (laughs) artists and whoever owns the rights, because there's publishing, which is like, if a character sings a song, you have to get the publishing rights, which is the tune and the words. But then if you want to play the actual song in the film, that's, you know, the the rights to the actual song is a, right. like the actual recording okay. of the song is a whole separate thing. Sometimes they're owned by different people. It's a very complicated wow. job and he is very good at it. I love that simple idea of like the song that is playing during a specific image that is so central to a movie going experience or a movie experiencing experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sense. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Well, so, okay. Thank you so much. I love, so I love learning about, learning out about this stuff too. This is so great, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> Um, going off of that, we asked this of everyone. Do you have a favorite? Uh, sometimes we ask, do you have a favorite performance? But sometimes mm. it's, um, what is one performance that you think every actor should see and study? Oh my God, those are such good questions. <laughs> mm. 
I'm like, what are your favorite movies? What are your favorite movies? Uh, yeah. um, it's interesting. I just, I just saw this movie for the first time. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a film called Sounder. So Martin mm-hmm. Ritt is one of my, Martin Ritt is one of my most favorite filmmakers, and I feel like he is under talked about. What's the phrase? I'm <laughs> under recognized. Un- goes largely unrecognized. Sure. He directed Norma Ray. Mm-hmm. and uh, Paris Blues and um, Sounder and a bunch of other really incredible movies. And he was a, a white guy who was telling stories about women and people of color mm-hmm. long before hashtag representation matters and suddenly right. white Hollywood was waking up to the reality <laughs> of the stories they were telling. Um, and and not a lot of people talk about him. And he's just, he was very groundbreaking and a very good storyteller. Um, and honestly, I would say like the, all the performances in all of his movies, but every single performance in Sounder, including the boy, and I'm totally blanking out on his name, but he's mm. got to be like 12 years old and 12 or 14 years old. And part of what's so incredible about his performance is just, I think child performances are very informative, even to adult actors, because a lot mm. of the times, especially if they're a good child actor, they're not, they're not acting. And I love working with kids mm-hmm. and I've worked with kids on every one of my movies. And mm-hmm. if you're lucky, you get a kid to just behave mm-hmm. on screen as opposed to like trying to act, quote unquote. Right. And so mm-hmm. I think it can actually be really helpful for adult actors to go look look at what it looks like to see the purity of just a child behaving on camera. Cool. Because I think that there's stuff to be captured in an adult performance from that type of behavior. Mm-hmm. And his performance is just like so simple and so honest and so heartbreaking. The movie is unbelievable. I think we watched it on Amazon. I think it's available on Amazon Prime. Oh, cool. But then also Norma Ray. Mm-hmm. Sally Field's performance in that yeah. movie. He's he's just, he's one of the like great ac- uh, actors, directors that we don't mm-hmm. talk about enough. And so I would just recommend going and watching. Cool. And um, uh, Ron Liebman, he plays um, opposite Sally Field in Norma Ray, and he was the original. He was in the original production of Angels in America, um, oh, mm-hmm. on Broadway, and he's a genius actor, and his performance is incredible too in the movie. So I always try to like think about what what are the movies that people aren't maybe checking out, or who are the filmmakers that people don't necessarily know about. And Martin Ritt is definitely up there for me. Mm-hmm. Well, and the child actor thing is interesting too, because the um, it goes back to what you're saying about watching actors give interviews, because that's more mm. themselves. Is that is that what's sort of in common there that you're connecting with a person just purely being themselves on screen, which is what I agree. That's what most good child acting is. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And there's this cool thing that happens when you become like when you become a very good actor where it's like Mm. behavior and self and character just kind of like Mm. I'm doing a thing with my hands that you podcast listeners can't see but I'm like putting (laughs) like I'm having holding my my two hands very far apart and then putting them on top of each other where it's like Mm -hmm. because you don't want to be yourself like it's funny it's like you want to watch an honest child performance and a lot of that is just them behaving and being themselves and you don't want to do that as an actor but you want to capture what it means to do that Mm and make the character that you're creating behave and yeah. just be a human behaving. And so it's this, it's, you Which know. It's different from adult it's a really, acting. In exactly, a way. Yeah. exactly. And it's an it's, incredible skill set that I hmm. would never dream of messing Doing with yourself. because it really is just, it's magic. It is magic, oh my gosh. Well, and so, okay, last question, going off of that, um, what should any act, you, you, you talked about uh, what you do when you're casting, but what should any actor who is auditioning for you, what should they know? Oh my gosh, that's I, I also, I also love auditions. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the time, and again, especially now, you have to do them. You know, you 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 watch casting videos um, as opposed to in person. Mm-hmm. And I think what actors should keep in mind, because I think there's like a notion that. Um, not getting to be in the room with the director is somehow a bad thing if they're just mm. watching casting videos instead. But I actually, in a lot of ways, prefer watching casting videos to being mm-hmm. in a room with an actor. It's like nice to meet someone and you do eventually. Like that's an important part of the process. But ultimately, because I'm directing stuff for the screen, it's so important for me to see how someone is on screen. Mm-hmm. Like if I was directing a play, obviously I would only do, I would only mm-hmm. want to do stuff in person. 
But, mm -hmm. um, you know, who, who you are in a room and who you are on camera are so different. Different. Yeah. It always blows my mind. Like Rachel Brosnahan, mm. it is bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a different person. Yeah. She is, she's just Rachel. And then, you know, the camera and the lights and it's just mm. like, wait, where's Rachel? Who's this? Who's this woman? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I think it's really mm. important to see actors on camera. And so actors, I think, should know that those on tape auditions that, you know, the casting director is sending to the director of the film are so important. Okay. So important. Even before and the, quarantine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I would always want to put mm -hmm. someone like I, I wouldn't. Unless, you know, it's a movie star who you've seen a million times on camera. But, like, oh. if you're a newer actor, like, I would always, even if I was just doing in-room auditions, like, I would definitely want to also make them put themselves oh. on tape. It's so important. Cool. And also just that, like, it's so, it's so scary, especially when you're doing a self-tape. Yes. And it's so important to distinguish yourself. And I cast Lily Reinert. Oh, uh -huh. In Miss Stevens, off of a self tape that she did, did she do it with her mom? I think it was her mom. And she, and she must she have been a real high 15. schooler. Fifteen, yeah. Oh yeah, she was fifteen, or was she fourteen? She was fourteen or fifteen because I think she was sixteen when we, or she was seventeen when seventeen when we shot. Um, I cast her off of that damn mm. tape. Cool. Because it was, I mean. A, she's a star, which helps. <laughs> mm. But she had like her headband on and her cardigan <laughs> and her notebooks. Like she really went for it. Gotcha. And I think that's so important to distinguish yourself. To sure. like really, like if you show a director that you're fully committed to that character in just a self tape. Even in the self tape, right. Like you don't, like don't just stand in front of a blank wall with a t shirt mm. on. Like make a choice. Excellent. I think it, it makes all the difference. That's excellent advice. Gosh, thank you so much. This is um, chock full of advice for creators, for writer directors who wanna make that leap like you were talking about to the artistic life, but also, yeah, for actors, whether or not they're auditioning for you, there's, there's really good stuff in here. So thank you. This was so fun. Oh. Thank you so much. I loved getting thank to you. talk about all of this. This was wonderful. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi guys, Christine McKenna Torella here, the backstage casting insider. At Backstage, our mission is to connect actors and creators with opportunity. And in line with that mission, at the start of the year, we planned on launching two major software additions to the site in 2020. The first feature launched in January an alternate profile category for voiceover, helping reflect that that skill is an art unto itself and that our actors with the interest and in resume could audition for voiceover roles. And of course, for our creators so they could easily find the correct profiles and features they need for their projects. The second major feature was an audition scheduler, launched in February, adding the ability for creators to be able to select talent, schedule, and manage an in-person audition all on the site at Backstage, making that process easier to manage for both actors and creators. Then March happened, and as a team, we brainstormed about how to be of service to our community. When the pandemic hit, we added the Slate which ended up being hundreds of hours of free content for the acting community. Access to high-profile casting directors, producers, talent agents in a variety of different presentations of panels, workshops, and Q&As, all aiming to help the community navigate this weird and uncertain time. We developed additional features on our site for creators and actors so they could be able to connect and audition safely. In April, we launched Remote Auditions, which was an add-on to the new audition scheduler we had just launched. It is a virtual audition room where actors and a casting team with multiple creators can audition safely. 
If you haven't used it yet, think Zoom, but a hundred times better. Manage your entire schedule of the audition. The actors have unique links to the audition room. The creators and collaborators can see resumes, headshots and reels all in one place and take notes virtually all in one place. And the audition material is now stored on the audition homepage and can be trimmed down after the audition to reflect the best take. We also launched pre-screens as a feature which actors and creators alike will benefit from. Here the casting team can request material as part of the application process and when the actor sends in the audio for voiceover or the video that's been requested, the team can review the material before requesting an audition. As a casting director, I have to tell you, I am super excited about this feature. It is a win-win for actors and creators. I get to see more actors do their work. More actors get to show me what they've got. We recognized that there were more remote work-from-home opportunities than ever. And so we've launched the ability for our creators to receive assets from talent and pay talent directly on the site. It's huge. (laughs) Finally, in the new year, we are launching a creator profile. Lots of exciting things coming that I um, can't wait to announce about that creator profile. But it is going to be an additional alternate profile so that our actors that wear many hats, our hyphenated creatives can um, reflect what they can do, but also that creators can seek jobs on the site. I don't know how to sum up 2020. There's, There's no words for how strange it's been. And I sincerely hope, um, we sincerely hope that 2021 is easier. But I have to say, I'm I'm incredibly proud and honoured to be part of a team that innovated and pivoted so well to meet the needs of the community that we serve, our acting community and our creators. That's all from me. I'll have casting calls next week, break a leg in your upcoming auditions, and I wish you a beautiful and happy new year. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.